today. It's good to see you all here. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a little bit uh, of, of uh, uh, excitement here. Um, uh, Karen falling, um, but it uh, looks like she's doing okay, and she's going to the hospital, and I know she wants to come back. And so, I mean, certainly that's our prayer, that, uh, that that will happen for her and then for us as well, so that she can join us on this day. I know so much you wanted to be here. Um, uh, but uh, you know, certainly things happen. I, I, um, and I told some of you that I was out running a couple, a couple of uh, um, week before last. And uh, uh, I run early in the morning when it's dark. And I was running on this street that I hadn't run for a while. And there was a, some kind of like a, almost like a speed bump, a heave in the pavement. So I'm running along and my, my foot catches that thing and, you know, down I go, and it's it's a helpless feeling, and so I just have a little bit of a sense of what Karen is feeling right now. So, um, uh, join me in prayer for Karen right now. Dear Lord, we ask your blessing on Karen as she uh, has encountered this little difficulty. We pray that indeed it will be small, and uh, she will be checked out okay, and will be able to return uh, to us here. We know, Lord, that you wanted to uh, be here, and certainly we want her here with us. So we uh, pray for her and, and Ron and, and all those in charge of her care that she may quickly return to us and that she'll be okay. We entrust her under your care. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, got a big day today. It's kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a sad one for me. Uh, in, because I very much enjoyed uh, the, the time that I spent with you these nine months. Uh, but you know what nine months brings? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a birth. It's a birth. And, and, uh, and that birth is going to happen on the 16th of uh, November when Jared, Pastor Jared arrives. And then on the 19th, he'll be installed as your new pastor. So uh, these are certainly some, uh, some uh, uh, um, exciting times for the congregation. Uh, but thankful for this uh, one last uh, time to worship with you and to lead you in worship and, uh, and, 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 and bring God's word and preside at the sacraments. Uh, uh, so uh, it's just good to be here. I just I want, to, I want to call, do just a few special call outs here. Uh, Judy, uh, thank you for everything. Trying to find these hymns that uh, that uh, you know that uh, fit with the, with the day and and ones that at least some of the some of you know and can sing and well, I think we did a pretty good job yeah I think, we, I think we did okay and Tom thanks for Tom he was my visitation friend and and, and partner and and uh, and right hand man on everything and and and, he, and you have a good leader here with Tom. And on top of everything. So, thank you, Tom. And then uh, just one other person, Joan. Uh, in, it's we did our email thing, and and and, use, and and the internet is a wonderful thing to you know to get bulletins and announcements and and all that stuff that's uh, that uh, um, that's necessary to you know get the printed things uh, uh, in line and. And I guess what I the only, only the only bad part about that is that uh, um, I don't I don't get to read the printed bulletin until Sunday morning and last Sunday morning I didn't read it real real closely and then I realized that got this the church is going to be late today and uh, and I didn't announce it and I didn't announce it no one said well Pastor Mark you better remind everyone that the church is going to be late next week but I guess you guys all knew that anyway so it really wasn't it really wasn't necessary uh, to announce it because I mean you just know what's happening and that's good and that's part of the beauty of a small uh, congregation um, so yeah we're here a little bit later um, and then a little bit later with Karen and everything, but and then uh, we'll we'll have some I'm looking forward to that uh, to that uh, food we'll enjoy a little bit later after after worship today. So, um, yeah, yes. I'd like so, to make an announcement, and then someone else in our family would like to get up and make an announcement. Um, I just want to let everyone 
know if you haven't heard or maybe you have heard, I think we need to extend congratulations to Jody Grove and her boys cross country. They will be heading the state next Saturday for cross country. So I think that's great. and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We join in our opening hymn number 229. That's a cross. 
Now, uh, I'm going to make some. I'm going to make some changes to the cross. Okay, and we're going to we're going to change it into something else. And see, let's see what we come up with here. Let's put um, this over here, and this over here, and these over here, and that over there. Okay. Now, what do we have? What does that What does that look like to you? Does it look like something that, that you might see on television on uh, Sunday afternoon? Mm -hmm. What does it look like? One of those football. One of those football. It looks like looks like goal posts on, on, on football. Okay. Well, we took we now think about this. We took we start off with the cross and we changed it into something else. That's something that's very different. Like like football is very different from the church, right? Okay, and from the cross. Okay. So what we need to do is is uh, well, first of all, is that is that a good thing to to, 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 to change something like the cross and put and, 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 and to change into something else like football? That's probably not a good thing either. Okay. So we need to we need to we need to change it back. We need to reform. And to reform, you ever heard that word before? Reform is to change. Okay, and today we see that the, that the pyramids are red, and this is the day called Reformation. And we remember a time in the church when, when, when the church had taken the, the things that are most important in the church about our faith and changed them into something very different. And then this man named Martin Luther, and you're going to hear more about Martin Luther in a little bit, he came along and said, no, we need to change things back to way to what they were. So... Can I have a volunteer from one of you and put this back into the, reform it back into a cross? And you're the birthday man, so you, better, you, you get to do that. Okay, excellent. Now it's, we've got it back in the cross again. So we've reformed it back into what it was supposed to, supposed to be. And that's just a reminder what we, need, what, what we need to do sometimes. Because sometimes we get, uh, we get we, we stray away from what God wants us to do and what the Bible says and, uh, and and God's love for us and Jesus is a central thing we try to get away from that and sometimes we just need to you know, reform and get back to the to the to this right here to this thing that, 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 that this the cross is, which is a reminder that God came in the form of Jesus and he died for our sins uh, so that we can have new life too. We just need to reform sometimes, right? Okay, and that's the message you want for today. Okay, thanks for coming up, and we'll continue with the scripture reading. Good morning. Martin Luther will not be said most of all that I am not a civil rights leader of the 1960s. That would be Martin Luther King, who no doubt his parents named after me, for which I am unnecessarily flattered. That little act which I just performed by attaching a piece of paper to the door of the church was a reenactment of something that I did on October 31st, 1517. On that day, I nailed a document to the door, church door in Wittenberg, Germany. I nailed it to the church door because in that time, the church door was in many respects the bulletin board for the community. I knew that many people would be coming to worship the next day, All Saints Day, and would see the document containing the theses. In the theses, I challenged the teachings of the church of my time on the nature of penance, the authority of the Pope, was the usefulness of indulgences. I know that some of those ideas may be unfamiliar to you, and I will solely try to clarify them during my message to you today. Anyway, my thesis sparked a theological debate that would result in the birth of the Lutheran, Reformed, and Anabaptist traditions within Christianity. Little did I know that my thesis would cause such a stir would result in such a multitude of teachings and denominations, or that one of those denominations would even bear my own name. 
Let me, let me make it clear that this was not my purpose or concern. My only concern or purpose was to bring changes or reform to the only church that I had known for my birth. To tell you about how all this happened, let me first of all tell you about myself. I was born on November 10th in the year of 1483 in the city of Eisleben, Germany. My parents were Hans and Margaret Luther and were on their way to Mansfeld to look for work in the copper mines. The next day was November 11th, St. Martin's Day, and my parents took me to the church where I was baptized and when I was given the name of the saint who was honored on that day. After a few days, my parents continued their journey to Mansfeld, where my father became a successful businessman. Having risen from the peasantry, he was determined to see his son receive a good education and bring further honor to the family. To that end, father sent me to schools in Mansfeld, Magdeburg, and Eisenach. When I was 17, in 1501, I entered the University of Erfurt. There I received a bachelor's degree in 1502 and a master's degree in 1505. According to Father's wishes, I enrolled in the law school of that university. He was bound and determined that his son would have a profession that would earn him enough income to provide for his parents in their old age. As you will see, my parents were in for a huge disappointment. Before I go any further, I must tell you a bit about how the Church of our day taught us to understand God and our relationship to Him. For the most part, we were taught that God was a God of anger and judgment. A well-known image of Jesus Christ is that He was a judge seated upon a rainbow with a lily protruding from one ear on a sword from the other signifying mercy to the saved or wrath for the damned, who were to be consigned one to eternal bliss, the other to everlasting torment. If there were best-selling books of this kind, it would not have been had the title How to See Rome, but rather How to Avoid Hell. <laughs> How to Avoid Hell, that thought consumed me. One of the teachings of the church of my time was that those who became monks or nuns who joined the monastery had a better chance of avoiding hell from God's, God's judgment. So what I am about to tell you should come as no surprise. When I was 22 years old in July of 1505, I was caught in a violent thunderstorm. A bolt of lightning struck the ground next to me and knocked me to the ground. In absolute terror, I cried out, Help, St. Anne! I'll become a monk! My life was spared, and so I honored my vow. I left law school and entered the monastery in Erfurt. <coughs> my decision to become a monk for a while bought me some spiritual comfort, but it wasn't long before the old fields returned that I would be rejected by God that I would be condemned by Christ and consigned forever to the arm of Satan. And so I became desperate. I engaged myself in long prayer vigils. I fasted then without food for days at a time. I took off as much clothes as decency would permit, but I could never gain any assurance that any of my efforts would make me right with God and give me peace in my heart. In the year 1511, I made a pilgrimage to Rome on business of the monastery. But I used that opportunity to visit sacred shrines and view sacred relics. It was my hope that by doing so, I could get some of the merits of the saints transferred to my heavenly account and thereby cancel out some of the sins that I had done and was under judgment for. I climbed on my knees the sacred stairs of Pilate's judgment fall, believed to have been transferred from Jerusalem to Rome. But when I reached the top, I doubted that what I was doing was having, was, was having any effect at all in God's eyes. I could not find God peace with God in this way, 
And so I turn to the sacraments, particularly the sacrament of penance. Now the sacrament of penance includes three parts. Contrition, that is being sorry for your sins. Confession, that is stating your sins to a priest or confessor. And satisfaction, which is doing something that proves that you are sorry for your sins. But as I thought about this, I wondered, how can I know if my contrition is truly sincere? And about confession, the sins of which I am aware, I can certainly confess them. But what about the secret sins, which may, I may have forgotten about? How could I be sure that I had confessed everything? If forgiveness depends upon confession, or complete confession is impossible, what hope was there for me? I thought that still there might be a way to find peace with God. In the history of the church, there have been those people who the church has identified as mystics. Man says the mystic who should cease his striving and yield himself to God. There just happens a weakness of man is overcome by the power of God. But there is here a very important condition. Man must love God. And at this point, I began to sink even deeper into despair. I began to doubt if the God I was seeking was even lovable. I reflected on some of the teachings of St. Augustine, who taught that man's fate is already predetermined. Nothing that one can do will make any <laughs> difference. The damned are damned, and the saved are saved, no matter what. What fairness is there in this? Who can love such a God? Love him? I do not love him. I hate him, I said to myself. I confessed all of my thoughts and feelings to my confessor, Dr. Johann von Staupitz. He was for me such a blessing. If it had not been for Dr. Staupitz, I, I should have sunk into hell. He listened patiently to me, but to my deepest questions he could only Answer, ich verstehe es nicht. As I said, that means I do not understand. But Dr. von Staupitz was a very wise man. He directed me to become a scholar and professor of the Bible. And so that is what I did. One might say that the Bible was given to me, and so I gave myself to the Bible. My first lectures as a Bible professor were on the Psalms, beginning in 1513 and continuing for three years. I remember what the profound effect Psalm 22 had on me. This psalm begins with the verse Jesus quotes upon the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I reflected on that word forsaken. Jesus, forsaken. Abandoned by God? That's exactly how I felt. But why was Jesus forsaken? The answer which I discovered through my study of Scripture must be that he who was without sin for our sakes became sin and so identified himself with our sinful humanity that he took unto himself the sin of us all. In this way he identified with us in our feelings of abandonment from God. I continue to find hope and strength in my study of and teaching of the scriptures. My studies and lectures on Paul's epistles proved to be life-changing. I long to understand Paul's epistles to the Romans, for nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the righteousness of God. Because I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust, meaning me. As I mentioned earlier, this caused me not to, this, this caused me to, to not love God, but to hate God. And yet I had a great yearning to know what Paul meant. Night and day, I pondered until I saw the connection between the righteousness of God 
Well, it's a statement from Paul in his letter to the Romans that the righteous shall live by faith. And then I finally understood that the righteousness of God is that righteousness by which, through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through our faith. I see that banner over there. It says, faith alone. And that is what I came to understand. This, this whole of scripture took on a new meaning. And it was as at that moment that I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors of paradise. The whole scripture took on a new meaning and would bear us before the righteousness of God filled me with hate now it, and terror. Now it became a, a gate to heaven. Now it became to me inexpressibly sweet. Let me read again for you a verse that you have already heard in your scripture reading this, for this morning. For behold, that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. This new understanding of the message of scripture has guided and led me in all of my thinking and teaching and is the primary reason that I posted my 95 theses and that I illustrated for you at the beginning of my message today. The main impetus for the posting of the theses was the sale of indulgences by the church. Now I must explain to you what this means. An indulgence was a document that was issued by the church which, when a proper fee was paid, declares that one's own sins or the sins of a family member were forgiven, or that one's own or a family member's time in purgatory could be significantly reduced. The church engaged the services of one Dominican monk, his name was Johann Tetzel, to collect the indulgence. It is said that in order to sell the indulgence, he used a little advertising jingle that went like this. When the coin in the copper clings, another soul from purgatory springs. <coughs> what infuriated me about this practice is that the church was trying to sell what God had already declared in his word to be a free gift, the forgiveness of sin. The sale of indulgences was just one of the many issues that I had with the church and with whom I disagreed. Of course, church leaders tried to get me to recant my positions or teachings. I stood in front of several hearings to make my case or present my argument. And the one that sent out in my memory happened, happened at a city called Worms in Germany. There was a trial of sorts in which church and government leaders were present, most of whom wanted me to repudiate my teachings. I was asked the question, do you or do you not repudiate your books and the errors which they contain? And to this question I said this, since your majesty and your lordship desire a simple reply, I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convicted by scripture on plain reason, my conscience is captured to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is this neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. And so a question that I would like to pose to you today is this. Where do you stand? My hope and prayer for you is this, that you stand on the power of God's word, that you claim God's free gift of forgiveness in Christ, and that this <coughs> will set you free to be God's servant in the world. Jesus himself says in the gospel you heard read for today, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. 
That is my prayer for you. Amen. <coughs> our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed and found on page 85. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people. According to their needs. Lord, we thank you for this day on which we remember the Reformation and the lives and witnesses of those who led the way in renewing the church. As heirs of this Reformation heritage, help us to be faithful to the truth of the gospel that the Reformers recovered for us. Help us to see that the church needs continuing Reformation and give us the wisdom and courage for that task. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, even as Luther found hope and strength and truth in the study of Scripture, give to us also the hunger to search and study the Scriptures, that we might be equipped to renew the church. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to come to us through your word and through the sacraments. Help each of us to make diligent use of the means of grace, to read and study your word, to worship and commune faithfully, and to live in the covenant of our baptism. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of life, and we thank you that you place us in the context of families. We give you thanks for our family members and loved ones. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord, bring peace of mind to the anxious, strengthen those who carry burdens, and surround the sick with your healing presence. We continue our prayers today for care and for those whom we name in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, you have called us to mission and ministry through our congregation, through our Northwestern Ohio Synod, and through our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Give us the strength we need to support this mission and ministry by giving of ourselves, our time, and our possessions. We ask your blessing, and we pray for strength for Pastor, uh, Pastor Jared Shaw as he soon begins his call as the pastor of St. Paul's. Bless the ministry that they will share together. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Also with you.
have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. We receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. that you have shown me, 
I'm grateful that you received my ministry and that we were able to work together to accomplish many good things. I am confident that God has already forgiven any mistakes we made and that God has already blessed the work we have done. We thank you for your compassion, wisdom, energy, and faith in you to our congregation. You have helped us in our time of need, and we are very grateful. You are a servant of Christ and a blessing to God's people. Will you, members with me of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, now release Pastor Mark Bogan from the duties of interim pastor. We do, but thanks to God. Will you pray for him as he continues in ministry in a new place? We will, but thanks to God. Will you, Pastor Mark, release and commit the shepherding of his congregation to his next pastor? I do, with thanks to God. Will you pray for us as we make a new beginning in our life together? as St. Paul's Lutheran Church. I will, with thanks to God. O oh God, through your everlasting love for all souls, and trustworthy and sure, give us confidence to go forward into the future, grateful for the goodness you have shown us in the past. Bless this servant of Christ, and bless our community of faith, for the sake of Christ our Savior and the Lord. Go now, Pastor Mark, surrounded by our love and led by the promises of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.